Hello everyone, I'm Penny Schultz. Joining us in the ONTV studio today is Abdu Murray. Abdu offers the credibility of the gospel message as a speaker and writer with Embrace the Truth. He has authored several books including Saving Truth, Grand Central Question, Apocalypse Later, and his latest More Than a White Man's Religion. For most of his life, Abdu was a proud Muslim until his nine-year historical, philosophical, theological, and scientific investigation pointing Abdu to the Christian faith. Abdu speaks to diverse international audiences and participates in debates and dialogues across the globe. Abdu holds a BA in psychology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Michigan Law School. Abdu lives in the Detroit area in Michigan, and his wife and his three children reside there. Thank you so much, Abdu, for being here today. Oh, Penny, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. You've been very busy. I have been. I have been. Um, uh, so as, as you said before, I'm uh, a speaker and writer with Embrace the Truth, and that's an organization that essentially offers the credibility of the gospel to every questioner we encounter. Uh, we believe that truth, when embraced, brings freedom, uh, but we pledge when we do that, you know, as we answer questions, and I've done these things, as you said, in debates and dialogues, college campuses, open forums, you name it. Our central focus is on answering people, not questions. You know, um, when we draw the thread from the Bible itself, when the, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 4 that we are to let our speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, mm -hmm. so we may know how to answer each person. It's really interesting because first, in this day and age when everything is so filled with anger and yeah. vitriol and combat, Paul, who was no stranger to those things, says that our speech is to be gracious and seasoned with salt so we may know how we ought to answer each person. And what's really interesting is Paul doesn't say we should know how to answer each question or each issue or each controversy. And all we do today is seem to answer issues and controversies and questions. No, Paul says we are to answer each person. So what we strive to do is answer people, not questions, because questions don't need answers, but people need answers. And they use questions to get them. And some of the biggest questions in life are the ones we're trying to address um, from a, a perspective of does the Bible does the message of the gospel and does the person of Christ actually have anything to say to us when life's toughest questions, whether it's existential questions like suffering or it's intellectual questions also like suffering, face us? So how can we actually answer these questions in a way that not only speaks to the heart but also engages the mind? So, Abdu, uh, you brought up about suffering. Mm -hmm. People wonder, where is God in suffering? Yeah. Recently, um, over a year ago, in our neighboring community, Oxford, there was a terrible uh, shooting that took place in the school, and people are still reeling from that. They're still asking that question, mm. where is God in suffering? Yeah, you know, I remember the, the day I got the news, in fact, the, the day it happened, I happened to be uh, outside of the state of Michigan. You know, my, my kids and I, we live in a neighboring uh, community here as well, and when my kids were in high school, because of our proximity to Oxford, when the news happened, that school, my kids' school went into lockdown. And for that briefest of moments, I remember my daughter telling me that she didn't know if it was happening at our school. And so that terror creeps in, uh, in that, that ever briefest of moments, but it's enough to shake you up. Can now translate that to this actual school where this is happening, and you can multiply that by about a billion of the actual terror people were experiencing and the heartbreak and the tragedy and the sorrow. I got the news, I was in Nashville at the time actually visiting a friend, and I had to cut my, my trip short because the first thing I thought to do was to talk to the pastors in this area who I have had the blessing of ministering with and wondering, is there anything we can do? And the first thing they thought of was to say, why don't you come up and we can do some Q&A with the kids um, at the youth groups. And they were being flooded. The youth groups yes. had quite a surge in attendance. And I was also blessed to speak at a person's home with a bunch of kids from Oxford, actually. Um, about, I'd say a week later, uh, who had very serious and deep questions. And the primary question was, where was God in this? How can, there, how, can there, how can I reconcile the idea that God is good and God is loving with a God that allows such horrible tragedy? Because the argument is pretty tough, you know. It is. They asked the question, you know, if God is good, he would want the suffering to stop. 
If God is all-powerful, he could make the suffering stop. Yet the suffering hasn't stopped, so either he's not good or he's not powerful, or as the skeptic might say, maybe he's not even there. Um, and it's a tough question, you know. Um, it's a tough one on an intellectual level, on a biblical level, the Bible actually addresses this, but then it comes down to where does all this stuff actually meet the road? Where does the rubber actually meet the road in our lives? So I, I like to pr pr first, first proceed from the philosophical, you know, from an intellectual level first, is because the question is never just intellectual, is it? True. It's always personal because it's either about someone who has suffered or it's asked by someone who has suffered. And it's a very deep and personal question. A skeptic might ask the question, not only where is God in all this, but they might say, is there any purpose in all this? I recall sitting across the table from a friend of mine who lost his mother when he was 10 years old. And he asked that question. He's like, my real question isn't even philosophical. He didn't say those words, but he basically said, I want to know how this God can possibly be good or value me and my mother when he let her die when I was so young. You know, for him, it wasn't just a philosophical question. We had been discussing philosophy up until that point, but that's when the conversation became very pointed and the philosophical rubber had met the existential road. And now he not, he, he not only needed a philosophically satisfying answer, but a personally engaging answer that could say that maybe there was purpose behind my mother's death. And he was an atheist when he asked that question. So I began to answer that question. Um, in this way. And this is part of what I shared with the, the, the high schoolers, the students, when I met with them, having come back up in the wake of the awful evil and tragedy of what happened in Oxford. Um, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, um, when we say, where is God in all this? What we're already presuming, we're already presuming something, and that is that this thing is evil. Of course it is. But when we say it's evil, what do we mean? Do we mean that it's inconvenient because you know, evolution has told us that we're here because you know, the might of the strongest dominated the weakness of the weaker and we happen to be here and so it's evolutionarily inconvenient for people to kill each other? Or are we saying it's actually morally wrong? And we're saying the second part. So when we say something like this is morally wrong, that if God could have stopped it, he should have stopped it, do you see how we've snuck in something? When we say he should have stopped it, we've snuck in the idea that there is an objective moral standard. That moral standard is the determiner between good and evil. And so if something is objective, that means that it doesn't depend on human opinion. Because you think about it, I mean, I don't know what your favorite color happened. What is your favorite color? Pink. Pink, okay, so your favorite color is pink, mine's red. Okay, so very similar, but not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to say red's a better color than pink, you would say, nah, -uh, and I'd say, uh huh, and you'd say, nah, -uh, and we would just back and forth. It's completely subjective. Yes. It's based on my opinion, it's based on the subject. But if I were to say, Abdu's favorite color is red, that is objectively true that my favorite color is red. See the difference? I do. It's not a personal opinion, it's just you're saying the fact is that's his personal opinion. It's wrong to kill babies for fun. That's not a subjective opinion. That's an objective reality that I think most of us would say is true. So for morals, for something to be evil or good, objectively, it has to not be based on human opinion. But here's the problem, Penny, is that if human beings are the only thing, if we're the highest form of creation, if there is nothing above us to give us the moral standard, then we're the ones who decide what's right and what's wrong. And we can't. And we can't because it's based on our opinion. Mm -hmm. And if history has shown us anything, human beings are terrible at this. We're ter I mean, it wasn't too long ago that where it was legal in this country to own people as property just because of their race. It's terrible. And it's in, um, immoral. It wasn't mm -hmm. moral just because it was legal. Right. It was immoral then. It's always immoral. That's objective. So the higher standard is God. It, it, it has to be. Always. It has to be, and here's why. Because Logically speaking, it has to be. Because if human beings are the determiners of what's right and wrong, that shifts based on who happens to have the most votes or who happens to have the most influence in that particular culture at that particular time. But if there's a standard above us, and that's a moral standard, it's important for us to know this. Morality is not just something. It doesn't just exist. You know, uh, without getting too philosophical, Plato tried this. Plato tried to say, we don't need gods to demonstrate what's good or not. 
because even the gods are subject to morality. Morality is a rule that even the gods have to follow. But for the Christian, this is not a problem because morality is not a rule that God follows. God is the source of the rule because he is the good. He is objectively good because goodness is not good. Justice is not just. Compassion is not compassionate because those things don't do any. Those are just concepts. They're just ideas. So if goodness is not good, then it violates itself. It can't be its own standard. So what I'm saying is, is that that has to result, that has, goodness can only be something we are obligated to follow if it's rooted in a person because things and concepts and ideas are not good. That's true. But a person is good. Mm -hmm. A person is just. A person is compassionate. So if there is a thing such as objective good, transcendent good across all times for all peoples, then that good has to be centered in a transcendent person. And that's exactly what the Bible describes as God. So when we ask the question, where was God in all this? As if we're asking, there, there can't be a God. We're actually presuming that morality exists objectively. And if morality exists objectively, then that morality can only exist if God exists. So evil does not s prove that God doesn't exist. Rather, evil in the world proves that there's a violation of the objectively good standard. Evil is not a thing. Evil is the violation of that which is good. And so goodness has to exist. It can only exist objectively if God exists. So the question really boils down to that. But then it becomes, what's the biblical answer, you know? And I want to know the biblical answer. So when you look at the Bible, um, you know, if you, were, if you were looking at a pie-in-the-sky book that would tell you what you want to hear, you wouldn't read the Bible. True. Um, the there's Bible, a lot in there you're like, oh, oh yeah, i got to do that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, not only that, it, there's that and there's so many things that call us, you know, the, Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 15 when he says that out of the heart, out of the human heart, wow. comes adultery, mm. theft, false testimony, slander, murder, and all these things. In other words, Jesus tells you what you, want, what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. What you want to hear is you're great, and if you just try hard enough, everything will go great. Every other system of belief tells you that, whether it's a Muslim belief or a Hindu belief or a, uh, uh, even an atheistic belief will tell you that if you share enough what resources and you educate yourself enough, we'll all live in a Star Trek-like existence. Um, but the reality is that that, that just... You, you can't at, attain to that. No, you can't. And history has shown us we, we're just terrible at this. Right. So when I see what Jesus says, he is a sheer stark realist. He tells us about life the way it actually is so that we know that we can't be our own savior. Every system of belief tells you you can be your own savior. Christianity is the only one that says you can't. Why is that important for our discussion? It's because the Bible tells us we should expect these things to happen. Not be okay with it. Absolutely not. We are to, be, we are to condemn injustice. We are to condemn evil um, and work to fight against it. But it does tell us that the human heart is the heart of the problem, um, that we are the problem so we can't be the solution. We need someone who's not us to save us from us. Jesus. Indeed. Um, and that's the heart of the Christian message. So from the biblical perspective, we sh I mean, the very first thing you see in the Bible after the original uh, human sin, which is um, rebellion against God, is that a brother murders his brother. It's the first thing you see. Um, and even then, God in his tenderness is returning to people to say that he binds up the wounds of the afflicted and he comforts the heart of those who are sorrowful. Um, and how do I know that? How do I know that in a personal way? It's not just a biblical thing, but the biblical and the personal start to come together on this. So we take my friend. My friend said, how do I know this God is good and values me or my mother if you let her die like that? <clears throat> you know, we've been going round and round for some time. And one of the things I said to him is, you know, as a matter of logic, if God exists, okay, so we're on, the question now we're debating is, does God exist given that there's evil and suffering in the world? The question we have to ask ourselves is this, is that if God exists, what is he like? And the Bible describes a God who knows all things. All things. Yes. He knows all past things. He knows all present things. He knows all future things. But he also knows what um, philosophers call, he has middle knowledge. He knows all future possible things. So for example, Penny, I could have chosen not to come here today. You could have chosen not to have me today. And 
a billion different decisions would have followed from my one decision and from your one decision, and your life would have taken a different, t different take, and then you would have affected other people in many, many different ways just from the one decision to not sit here, you and I, today. Um, there are people who are watching who might otherwise have tuned out, and your life will be different now had you chosen not to watch this. God knows not only what will happen, but he knows what would have happened if you chose something differently. In light of that, I told my friend, in light of the fact that if that's the kind of God we're talking about, isn't it at least possible that he could allow, not cause, this is important, he does not cause the suffering, but he could allow suffering for some greater possible purpose that he's working out, whether it's five minutes from now or 50,000 years from now. You know, eventually he agreed it's at least logically possible. So then we came down to this and he said, but my mom, but my mom. And I said, you know. Broken hearted. He said, yeah. no amount of philosophy answers that question. No. It doesn't, it doesn't. And I, I didn't want to give him that. And in that moment you pray. And for those who are watching and who have suffered some kind of loss, especially from a year ago, maybe you're not even fearing, you're not even suffering the loss of a loved one because they were in some ways victimized by this dastardly, horrible, evil deed. But maybe you're feeling the loss of your sense of security, of your sense of safety, of your sense of what it means to go to school, about your sense of what it means to be in a public place, uh, about your place in this world and how do you know this won't happen again. There's a million things you're suffering from um, because of this. It's not just the direct physical. There's a mental, there's an emotional, and there's a spiritual loss to that. What I want you to hear, you, you to hear is that the philosophy can help to a certain point, but it only stops short because it's got to reach here too. So when I look at my friend and I told him, I said, you know, it's a nice theory that God could allow suffering for a greater possible good. In other words, he works through this. He allows us our human free will. He allows us to act with free will and that sometimes results in evil, but he works things out for good. It's a nice theory. Sure, maybe a Muslim could say that, or a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Jew, or a run-of-the-mill theist, someone who believes in God but doesn't know what that means exactly. They could all say that God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. It's trite and it's cliche. Sure. But I said, can I tell you, though, that I, as a Christian, have more than cliche. I have more than just a theory that God might allow suffering for a greater good, is that I have history provable history that shows me that God did allow suffering to happen to his own son, which is the cross, that Jesus dies on a cross to pay a debt of sin that I owe, not that he owes, he owes no debt of his own, but he pays it willingly on my behalf and undergoes the punishment for the sin for the entire world. Mm -hmm. He knows what it's like to have God's wrath for the entire world all past people and all future people in one moment, which is why he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't, he, it's not that he doesn't know. He's quoting Psalm 22. It's out of the anguish of the heart, he feels that forsakenness because we're supposed to, yeah. because of our sin, but he, does, but he does it for us. But then through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, he overcomes that and he says that this forsakenness, this feeling that I have felt, I felt it for you so that you never have to. So here's what I said to my friend. I said, um, God might allow suffering for a greater possible purpose, and that's a theory. But in the Christian faith, God actually allowed suffering for the greatest possible purpose, the salvation of the whole world. He allowed suffering to happen for his son. So if I can know that he allowed it in the past, I can trust without knowing all the answers. I don't know why he let your mom die. I don't know why he let Oxford happen. I don't pretend to know these answers. And anybody who tells you they know is probably lying or guessing. Um, but what I can tell you is I can trust God for what he will do with my suffering because of what he has done with his own suffering. And that saved the entire world if they just believed. Through his son, Jesus. And that's, and that's his son. Mm -hmm. He didn't just say, I'll let someone suffer, his own son. And so you have the son who suffers on the cross, but you have the father who suffers having to actually forsake him. Um, and as a father, I can tell you, I can't imagine a greater sacrifice. Um, a friend of mine once said, as a mother, he said, if you asked me to sacrifice myself for my child, I would do it so fast, it wouldn't even qualify as a sacrifice. 
but if you ask me to sacrifice my son for someone else, I would say no so quickly because I would never let my son go through that. And that showed her the father's heart, how he gave his own son for us. Then I said one last thing to him. You asked how I know that God values you or your mother. And I said, you know, how do you know how valuable anything is? You only know how valuable something is by what you're willing to pay for it. And so the God who is the creator of the entire universe, the objective source of all reality, tells you, tells me, tells my friend, tells his mother, and tells any one of you who might have experienced some suffering that you and the one you have lost is so valuable that the infinite creator of the universe paid an infinite price to spend eternity with you and with your loved one. A blind, pitiless, indifferent universe doesn't give you that. Your questions are spoken into the wind if there is no God. But if there's a God who made that wind possible, then the answer is real. And it's not just, boy, maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. What I want people to know is that you can know it's true. It's not just a matter of, do I believe it in my heart? That's a big part of it but it's objectively true. There's a history behind this. There's a reality behind all of this. And so we go from the intellectual to the biblical, but now to the personal, and that's where Christ comes in. That's incredible. Um, I love how you've explained this, Abdu, and I also understand that people will have more questions about mm -hmm. this. How could we pursue this further, this quest, mm -hmm. this discovery, and how could people connect with you mm -hmm. to ask some of those questions looking for answers? Absolutely, I'd love that. Um, if people can connect with us, you can go to you can three ways. The first way is just to go to our, uh, send us an email at mail, M-A-I-L, at embracethetruth.org, one word mail at embracethetruth.org or go onto our YouTube page. It's uh, youtube.com slash official, and there's a bunch of videos on there, uh, some of which address this issue of suffering and pain. Um, or go to our, our website, embracethetruth.org. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I, I know people want to understand um, with their heart mm -hmm. what's taking place here. We can look at it from a mind's perspective, yeah. but our heart needs to connect with that knowingness. Yeah. People will want to know um, Jesus as their Lord and Savior, mm. but sometimes it's a difficult process because they don't have the right people to ask those difficult questions. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, this is important too because it's not just giving people syllogisms and answers and yes. history and this kind of thing, uh, because you have to really realize that oftentimes pain can be so blinding and so impactful that you don't even see the loved ones around you who love you deeply and dearly. So the, let me just say this, the first thing I would encourage anybody here um, who's watching, listening, who's gone through any sense of loss um, is don't isolate yourself. Make sure you're around people who care about you and who have the good sense sometimes just to shut up and listen or to say nothing while you say nothing and just sit with you in your grief. You know, Job lost everything and his friends sat with him and they did the best they could for a certain amount of days and then they made a mistake. They started talking and that derailed the whole thing. Sometimes just sitting with someone. But then when you have a question, when you have an issue, if you can be around someone who's, who, who, who's a trusted person, who won't just give you cliches, um, but give you answers, I think that's an important uh, thing for you to, to look out for and to search for. And we want to be here for people who, who, who might need those answers as well. And so reach out to us. We'd be happy, we'd be delighted to, to walk with you in in those moments of pain and suffering because we walk with Christ who walks with us in our own sufferings yes. as well. And he does. Every day mm. we can lean on him. Um, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, lean upon God, not mm. your own understanding. Yeah. Acknowledge him. He will direct your steps. And what you've done today is acknowledge God. And I know he's directing your steps, Abdu. Thank you so much for debating this issue with people. Mm -hmm. I know that you've gone to universities where maybe they haven't heard the gospel mm. message. Yeah. What are some of the most interesting questions that are being asked of students on universities that you've been able to provide mm -hmm. Uh, an informed answer to. Yeah, you know, and you know, Penny, the, the questions have shifted. Um, the more I've gone to universities, I've noticed something is that oftentimes the questions used to be 
propositional truth questions, more evidential questions like uh, science and faith. Did Jesus really rise from the dead as a matter of history? Did David exist as a person, even though the Bible says it? Is there any real history behind this outside of the Bible? Uh, did the Bible get certain things right or wrong and all those? Those were the questions that were primarily asked, and they're still asked on university, que on university campuses. But what I've noticed is the questions have shifted so that the primary questions are no longer evidential, now they're moral. So people are now asking questions like not, is the Bible true, primarily, now they're asking, is the Bible good? Is the Bible moral? Is Christianity good? So questions like, does the Bible condone slavery? Does the Bible condone racism? Does it condone sexism? Because you seem to see these troubling passages in the Bible. And right now, in our social climate, questions of justice and fairness and equality, whether it's racial or gender equality, these are the questions of the day. Uh, questions on sexuality and all these things. These are the primary questions people are asking, uh, and they're moral-based questions, which goes back to the fact that I said in the top of, top of the program, which was the moral questions only make sense if the God we're putting into question actually exists in the first place. So I think we start there, and then we can actually reach them because the Bible speaks very clearly, and I think profoundly, on equality amongst race, uh, uh, the different ethnicities, but also equality amongst the two genders, male and female. It speaks very specifically about how all people are equal before God. We're all equally sinners, but we're all equally offered redemption because we all equally bear God's image. That's beautiful. You writ, uh, wrote a book, mm -hmm. your most recent one. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that and tell us the title again. Sure, it's a More Than a White Man's Religion. Interesting. The idea here is that because of these questions I'm seeing, not only on college campuses, but just turn on the television, look at your social media for 10 minutes. Any one of these issues will come up primarily. And I think with the polarization of the world right now, the politicization of everything, including religion, Christianity has become to be known, especially in the West, as a white male religion. Um, when the reality is, it is a white male religion, but it's not just a white male religion. It is a, it, it is a belief. Um, the gospel message is for people who are white, people who are not white, people who are male, people who are not male. It's for everybody. But it's become to have come this characterization that it is a white male dominated religion that's used to impose its will on people of color and women. When the reality is, the, the, the reality of history is exactly in the opposite direction. Yes, is there a problem in Christian history with people who have used and misused and abused the Bible? Humans. Right, to exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, a good friend of mine, Frank Turek, once said, um, <clears throat> if you love Mozart and you go to a concert and the orchestra plays Mozart terribly, you don't blame Mozart, you blame the orchestra or the conductor. Um, and I think that's a powerful way to look at it. That's brilliant. If you look at Christianity and people are playing Christian poorly, mm -hmm. you don't blame Christ for it, you blame the followers. What is the message that Christ gives us and what are examples of the way in which he not only vaunts the value of all people of different ethnicities? And Jesus, by the way, doesn't just incidentally talk about ethnic similarity, uh, sorry, equality. He specifically and intentionally talks about it. He doesn't just incidentally talk about women in terms of their value. He specifically goes after this issue of sexism because it was rampant in his day. And he was not a product of his time. There was an atheist professor who pointed out to somebody, a colleague of mine, that one thing about Jesus, this is an atheist talking, he says one thing you can know for sure about Jesus, he was not a product of his time. He upended everything. He sure did. Indeed. Thank God. Yes, indeed. And we can read and understand mm -hmm. and live our lives through what Christ Jesus did at the cross for all of us. Amen. That's right. Abdu, is there anything else you want to share with us today before we close? Mm, uh, all I would say is this, is that as you know, we're drawing on the anniversary of what happened here in Oxford, mm -hmm. is in order to prepare our hearts, I think, for this situation and to think about how we, what we've learned in the past year, it's that um, if there is a, a blind, pitiless, indifferent universe, then you just look into the abyss and it looks back and it doesn't care. It has no ability to care. But there is one who does. Uh, he cared so much that every, he gave everything of himself so that we can know that suffering is real, it's not an illusion, it's not fake, that your loss means something. You know, pain is the signal of value. When you lose someone and you feel that pain, it shows that that person had real value to you. Christ was willing to undergo 
an unspeakable amount of pain because that's how much you mean to him. And if you're struggling to know you have meaning or purpose, I would ask you to consider him. Consider him as a source for meaning in all of this. You've got to find answers somewhere. You'll either find them in the nothing or you'll find them in the one who created everything. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate you coming today and, and meeting with us and sharing your heart. Mm. And um, I'm looking forward to reading your last book. Mm. Yeah. And then would you come back again? I'd I love would be to honored. have you back here. And it would be an honor. You have a lot to share, and, and I so appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It would be an honor, Penny. Thank you for having me. It's been a real joy spending time with you. Thank you, Abdul. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Orient Outreach. We will have Abdu back on again and be sure to connect with him with some of the resources that he provided. Thank you and God bless.